Welcome to Talking Giants presented by SeaGeek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner. My co-host, Justin Pennick is back. Glad you're feeling better. Uh, we got Dan Duggan on the show. I know this is uh, a day delayed, but I wanted to have Dan Duggan on before Draft Month came on because we don't have any interviews for Draft Month. And I want to congratulate the listeners. Your bullying worked. Nick Filato is going to come on the show Friday oh. after initially saying, I got to move. So we, we bullied him in, and the Mid-Round Prospect show is coming this Friday. Justin, how are you? Well, you know what they say. Bullying works. That is what they say. And we are a culture of violence on this show. I'm good, man. Uh, thanks to everybody that kind of reached out to say to, to feel better. I really appreciate that. This is, I'll be real. This is kind of the best that I felt since, since like the season. I, I kind of got burnt out by the season between the postseason and then the senior bowl came and it was super, it was all just very, very busy. I never fully, I never fully recovered from it. So it, it, it felt good. I, I feel good. And, uh, I had a great conversation with Dan Duggan, as always. He was down there in Tampa this week for for the owners' meetings. I will be out for the stream in a couple minutes, Sam. Orlando. One minute. And, um, yeah, that's uh, Talking Giants. That's what we got coming up. Excited about uh, Nick Filato. All right, let's uh, bring on Dan Duggan first. Justin, why don't you talk to us about something? I'll talk to you about something, and that's DraftKings. The thrill and excitement of March Mania, it's here, and it's still here. It's still going on. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. You can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code WORLD. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code WORLD. The crown is yours. Gambling prom, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help us available for problem gambling. Call 888-887-897777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuing. See dkng.com slash bball for eligibility deposit restrictions. Terms of responsible gambling resources. Bobby Skinner and Dan Duggan, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. I, I, I'm second last now, but at one point I was dead last in our tournament group of like 370 people um unreal uh but i still love the tournament all right and here is dan duggan of the athletic all right we now welcome on to the program of the athletic dan duggan dan you're about 45 minutes west of me if you ever you know if you want to come over to the beach and hang out uh, uh for the for the owners meetings this year any anything anything sticking out about your orlando experience nfl owners coaches you know all that stuff this is one of the more unique events um, because obviously when the owners are flying around the country for their meetings, they're not going to like the Holiday Inn on the highway. They always do it at some pretty swanky resort. Uh, so this one's at the Ritz Carlton. So we kind of get access to that side of the world, but like not really. Like they literally will put up like ropes where like the media has to stay on this side and the NFL people on the other in, in some parts of the hotel. Uh, but other parts you are able to mix in. It's way more casual. Like the combine is has more of a work feel to it. Um, here, everyone's guards down a little bit. It's just the head coaches, the GMs, and the owners, so it's not quite as big of a crowd as the combine. It's usually a pretty fun event. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It's not like the heaviest lifting. It's nice. You get to talk to all like the main point people in the organization. But otherwise, you have a lot of time to just kind of mingle around. And you, again, you like can run into anybody who's anybody is here in terms of um, you know the higher ups in the NFL world. So it's kind of. It's kind of a good setting, but yeah, it's not the it's not the hardest assignment. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you and say that. Are the owners like hanging out by the pool, like some swimming? Like, well, what is what is the vibe from them? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a range. I feel like I think a lot of times, um, especially like coaches and GMs, they make it like a family trip because a lot of them have like young kids, so they'll bring the wife, they'll bring the kids, and so yeah, they'll be running around the pool, and I think you know you'll see them kind of maybe uh check out because they do have meetings but once in a while you'll catch a like a coach like you know coming back clearly from the pool in, like his bathing suit uh i don't know if mara is like a huge pool guy i did see him he doesn't like, seem he, was, he seems like i've ne you know hasn't taken his shirt off you know in, in like 10 years type of guy but i think he's like a big he's, he's a big walker i think i saw him it looked like he was going for a walk actually so i'm really yeah. today he's kind of like in athletic clothes uh i've seen him walking around at, at previous owners meetings um but yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't seen Dave or Shane like you know by the pool. Uh, I I don't hang out by the pool. That's probably like the, the line. I don't really think it's probably for me the reporters to cross is be like hanging out at the pool. But uh, no, some of them. I think I don't think Dave will say brought his kids. I don't know if Shane brought his, but sometimes the coaches and gyms do do that, so they get a little little getaway on Goodell's dime. So this isn't like you know the combine. They always say you know there's the stuff going on in the field, and you know so who cares about that? But it's 
the conversations that you have with the players, and obviously it's the it's the agents that you have conversations with for free agency. The owners being no, nothing along those lines of where that kind of big, dramatic, important stuff happening behind the scenes, right? Yeah, no, this is much more concentrated. I mean, it's like for my purposes, I'm really here for the, the media sessions you get with Marek. I mean, this is the only time he talks now. It used to be he would talk before training camp, after the season. Like, this is the one time he talks. Spoke for half an hour. I'm sure we'll get into some of his comments. Like, He's as open a book as there is, so that you can't miss his uh, kind of state of the union because he actually gives good stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, Shane speaks a handful of times throughout the year, but this is one of those times. And then we got Dable for half an hour today. Wasn't quite the uh, most fruitful session with him, and you get him obviously a lot more often. But like that's the main purpose for me is to get that time with them. But then you're also hoping to get some casual face time with them. Like there's a party every year on Monday night here where people's guards are down, so you can you can chit chat. And also, you know, touch on some work-related things. And then, yeah, if you have other, um, you know, people that you need to talk to around the league, um, it's it's a great setting because they're all here. Um, but like, I'm obviously mostly Giants focused. So there's, you know, not a, mi- a million a bu- or a bunch of quotes that came out from Mayor or Shane that really stood out. Obviously, people focus on any co- any comments on the quarterback situation. Is there anything that you learn from either Mayor or Shane that you, you didn't? have like a great grasp of, grasp of going in? No, I mean, I think, um, like I said, I think Mara is just kind of honest, though, about sort of how he views this regime, where he still supports them, but he did call last season a huge disappointment, so he wasn't, like, glossing over that. Um, you know, I, he still believes in them, but then I asked him a question, like, do you have, like, a direct conversation? Like, hey, Joe, you're going to be here for X amount of years, because that obviously could impact how a guy, you know, operates. And, and, you know, Shane would never admit that, but you kind of feel like you're on the hot seat. It just might, you know, dictate how you build the roster. And and Mara said, like, like they know I support them, but no, I don't give any guarantees. And then I asked another question, like, you know, they came in together. You've had GMs and coaches on different timelines. Do you view them as a package deal? And he said, no, I don't view them as a package deal, which I was actually surprised he even answered that. But it almost, yeah. like, laid the tracks that you could say in a year because he said they have different responsibilities, different jobs, so they can be judged by different levels of success. So if they have a bad season on the field, it does feel like maybe Dable could get fired and Shane wouldn't or something like that. It's just the fact that he didn't say, yeah, but they're totally, um, because they always say they're in lockstep, but he didn't paint it that way. He's like, no, they're not a package deal. So that, that stuff was interesting. Uh, I definitely felt like funny. I felt like people ran with the quotes of Mara saying he wanted Dable to tone it down a little more and Dable saying, I wish I did things differently. My takeaway from this was like, that was swept under the rug. Like they don't feel like it's a big deal. They feel like it's overblown. Because in both of their comments, it was also like that was one part of it. But more, the the theme of it to me was more like, but hey, you know, I'm passionate. That's how I'm going to be. And from Mara's point of view, like I don't think that's really become a problem. So I don't think he really got called into the office and and sat down and said, listen, you need to make drastic changes. I think um, they don't think it's as big a problem as, as maybe outsiders do. Well, let me ask you that. Since h- how do people in the bil- building feel about Dable generally after the wink wink fallout? It's kind of like obviously to say, no. outside of Joe Shane and, and John Mayer and the player, like, you know, the people who are, you know, sca- you know, the people that they're working with to build the team on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Well, it's been a lot of turnover and obviously the holdovers are mostly, you know, a little more stable loyalists, you would think, right? Like the people who either didn't get fired or didn't leave for um, lateral well, what moves. What about like- a Jerome Henderson or Andre, pa- like Jerome Henderson, who's been here, Patterson, mm-hmm. who hasn't worked with Dable in the past. Like what did those two guys not not yeah. that specific, but guys like that. How do they feel? <laughs> yeah. So not that specifically, but answer that question hypothetically. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, like I literally, I couldn't tell you like specifically what those two guys think. I could just say more like the general feel, and like not to go back into what we were covering so much in January was to, to my last question: how they don't view the screaming and losing your mind as a problem. For multiple members of the coaching staff, they felt it was, and not because like oh, Dable's so mean. It's because it's like all right, call the run on first and ten lost three yards. I'm trying to figure out what the play is going to be on second and 13. And you're just mother effing me for the play. I called on first down. And it's like, I have one coach that you live to like take the headset off to just to concentrate or, or vice versa. If you're on defense and I call a play and they, they, you know, break a 20 yard run. It's like, all right, now I got to think about what the next play call is. They're in the red zone now. And instead I'm just getting cursed out for like the stupid play call I made. So that's the stuff that like, I, it's not, he has to control his temper because he's mean. It's like just on game day, it's distracting and counterproductive. Yeah. So um, listen, I don't know. I can't go down the roster of coaches that are still there, how they all feel. 
but I don't think that was an isolated feeling. And a guy like Mike Kafka, who was the one who really got like browbeaten the most as far as like his play calling, I doubt that as much as people want to pres- like portray it as like, oh, there was no friction there. Like, I doubt he's like, I can't wait to go back into another season if he's calling plays, which again, maybe is a topic we'll get to, I'm sure. Um, oh, that'll be great to do that again. You know, I think that there definitely is still some residual effects of because that's just how Dable is. He was the same way in 2022. It's just a lot worse, obviously, when you're losing and things start to snowball. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned Dable calling plays, and you know, with obviously Wink was the storyline because he's the one who left, and that the ending was the big blowout. But everything that's been reported to me, man, it's like, man, if anyone's got a, a gripe, it's Kafka. But they promote him to assistant head coach. Um, you know, they're, you know, he's still the offensive coordinator, but it seems like Dable's going to call plays. How is that relationship? Is that a relationship that they've mended and it's, it's good going forward? Or is it like, this is a one year, hope you can get a head coaching job type of <laughs> relationship? That's a good question. Cause again, the relationship, I mean, Kafka is just such a different personality than say Wink. So even if he has some issues with Dable, he's the type of guy who's going to suck it up and not, you know, broadcast it or, or you know wear it on his sleeve as much as wink did um, but obviously just as a professional with pride and being a competitor like th- there's no way there was a good feeling for him last year when you're getting play calling yanked and, and again like dables big footing him on you know having more of an input on the offense and you can say right wrong or indifferent because i think that's totally dables right to do that but if you're the guy who's the coordinator in that situation you're not gonna like that <laughs> like and it's not like these guys have this long history like, oh they're great friends they go back 20 years he came in here the only reason he left Kansas City to come here was to be the play caller. He didn't come to like be the Giants OC as a you know non-play caller. That that's not going to really advance your career. So um, I think that's one of the biggest things that yeah I think hey the assistant head coach title obviously a pay bump that comes with that that can smooth some feelings. But my impression coming out of this as little as Dable said today is that I really think Dable's going to call the plays. I thought that since you know going back to January that was the vibe at the time like. This is a huge year. He's gonna, you know, have his hands on everything. Um, so if you're if you're Kafka and you're losing that that role, sure, okay, I'm gonna be sitting in more meetings to get me ready to be a head coach. But I want to be calling plays again. That's why he came here. But uh, of all the things Dable said, he referenced how many coaches around the head coaches around the league call plays, and he said he's been researching it. You're not doing all that research because you're like, oh, we're just gonna run it back with Mike as the OC. Like again, there's a reason why he's doing that research. So. Uh, I think it's very much a line for him to do it. I'm sure he'll be cagey about it. We'll be trying to have, you know, binoculars at training camp and preseason games, see who's got the the play sheet. But uh, I think it's very much lining up for him to be the play caller. And I'm sure Mike Kafka doesn't want to be like the long-term Giants OC here as not calling plays. So I would think, I would think in a lot of ways, next year probably Kafka's last year with the Giants one way or the other. Either he's moving on to bigger and better things or it's another bad season and he would easily, you know, I'm sure that, uh, he could easily go. Dable could go. So I think there's a lot of things that would line up. But that's probably Kafka's uh, last season, for better or worse. Here, I mean, Dan, as you know, the past was a long time ago, and the future is a long way away too. You like that one? That was that was really good. It was, tough was really because, good. I mean, listen, I know he's not going to say much, but I just don't like the fact that he came out, you know, first thing Monday morning after the finale, and they did the presser, and obviously there were so many dominoes that they knew were going to fall, so they got way yeah. out in front of it, and we couldn't ask him any questions. He didn't talk at the combine. So now it's like, oh, guys, that's old news. It's like, well, yeah, but you never yep. talked about this it. This was so their like, plan. This is exactly what they exactly, wanted. Yeah, to, it was like a TV show the way they did that Monday after the yeah, season. It's it was like, very like a diabolical plan to like well, use the media to get what they want. Exactly. Which I and didn't like, hate because Wink used the media a lot too. But Oh, uh, and then Wink stepped. like It was like one of those cartoons where you put like uh, branches over a, a hole in the forest. Like Wink stepped right in the trap. Like, oh, mean, my and God. So, it was... <laughs> Was, but so to, was, to Justin, to Justin's point, there. Yeah, so Dave wouldn't really go to the past. But then you're asking him even just basic stuff about like players you just signed. You gave them a lot of money. Like, what's their role going to be? It's like, oh guys, it's only March. You know, the season's so far away. It's like so that was that my tweet there was out of frustration. Like, listen, yeah. I get you're not going to reveal like who you're going to draft, but like, what position is Jermaine uh, Luminor going to play in April? Like, you can answer that question presumably, and you just yeah. wouldn't even go there. That was that was a little frustrating. All right, so that, so that, so that's another thing, man. For I, I want to start with Neil, and and you know, it kind of brings up a Luminor uh, uh, up there too. Where, man, out of all the things that I don't be- uh, out of all the things I don't believe, or out of all the things to get frustrated with smokescreen season about, right? You know, everybody gets talks about quarterbacks or, you know, or, or who's going to call plays or, or what, right? <clears throat> the thing that I can't believe is I can't believe that 
I, and I also, I, I won't believe that the Giants have not told Evan Neal to prepare for life at guard. You can go and compete for the right tackle job, but Jermaine Elamunor is a better football player than Evan Neal right now at, the, at, the, at their points of their careers. And I can't believe that if, if and I think when he's going to win that job, Elamunor, that we're just going to have Evan Neal be the swing tackle? No, prepare for life at guard and compete anywhere. So I can't believe that and I refuse to believe that the Giants haven't told Evan Neal to prepare for life at guard, despite, I guess, this week, they haven't, they're haven't. they saying that they haven't told Evan Neal to prepare for life at guard, correct? <laughs> yeah, no, that's what Shane said. Like, that's not the plan. Um, no, that's going to be interesting to play out because, like you said, you, if you're going to make that move, you'd want the guy to be you know working with whatever old line trainer he's with at guard. <laughs> um, and, you know, We've seen that's not always the easiest shift to practice in one position and then have to switch on the fly, like, hello, Josh Zudu. Um, so I think, yes, the, the plan is for him to open the spring at right tackle, assuming he's healthy. Like at the end of the year, I was told he'd be ready for the spring. They didn't really give a concrete update this week. I don't, so I don't know exactly what to make of that, but assuming he's healthy, I think he'll be getting reps at right tackle and Illuminor presumably will be at right guard, you know, it could be left guard, but I think he'll be at guard. So if you have those guys at those positions, and again, I agree with you, Illuminor has been a better right tackle for the two years that Evan Neal's been in the NFL. I mean, he started like 30 games, a tackle over the past two seasons, uh, formed obviously much better than Neal has. But so, at what, yeah, at what point, if Neal's not making progress, and, and when are you even going to be able to measure that? You can't measure it in the spring when there's no pads on. Now we're going to get into camp. There's like a week of camp with no pads on. So like, what is Evan Neal going to get like a two-week trial run to like the first preseason game? And if he still looks the same, then we just make this drastic switch. Like it, it's a tricky situation. Like I, but they seem very hesitant to just give up on Neil and, and say he's a guard now. So I think that's how it's going to play out. And I think they, I think they trust that Illuminor can make the shift to tackle because he has done this throughout his career. He's kind of been the utility man, even though he's kind of settled in a tackle. But for Neil, if he if he fails at right tackle, is he going to be able to go and be a quality guard if he hasn't been working that position at all? Did did they say Elmanor is going to work at guard at all? Because I know they, uh, Shane said that Neil's going to work at tackle. Yeah, yeah. So that was a kind of a back and forth with Shane, and I said, so that means Elmanor will be at guard then. If you're saying Neil's going to right tackle, like you didn't bring him in, pay him seven million to be a swing tackle. I don't think and maybe it ends up that way. And he kind of wishy washy, like yeah, but you know he's played all he's played all four positions but center. Like it's good to have that versatility. And again, like. All this stuff sounds good when they're just kind of speaking like on a talking point, but it's like, yeah, it's great to have versatility. If you had a good starting five, Trey Illumino would be an amazing swing tackle and back up at all four spots, but he needs to be starting. So like, he's going to have a position. So again, that's why it's like when you ask Dave that question, like, yeah, we're going to start him at right guard and then we're going to see how it goes. He wouldn't even say that. So he's, I believe that's the case, but nobody point blank period said that, but I just can't imagine the state of this offensive line right now he's not considered one of the five best, even if it's a guard, which might not be his best position. I have to think he and Runyon would start, you know, the first day of OTAs at the two guard spots, assuming Neil's at right tackle. Yeah, obviously everyone points the quarterback, but if there's one thing outside of that that Giants fans should not feel comfortable about is their offensive line plan right now. When you lose that second round pick for the Burns, that it becomes a lot more complicated of bringing one in through the draft to where I'm, you know, I don't know what they're going to do with our, but to me, a, a plan of loser, loser, loser at tackle gets to play guard is obviously not the best plan. I just feel like they need depth. Like they, they did all that rotating last year, and then like none of those guys ended up even playing in those spots. And Azudu popped out the left tackle. Ben Bredesen. Anyways, they didn't have a backup center. Like it was just kind of a mess. And you don't, you still kind of have the the same worries about it. Uh, just with the hope run, you could be better than Gowinski. Um, are they interested in outbidding the Vikings for McCarthy? I mean, that's the one that everyone's been trying to get a handle on. You're talking to people down here. And, and the draft stuff is so hard because, like, I mean, Shane kind of got, um, like, pushed back on that of, like, any noise that's out there is false because only few people know what we're doing. And I think that, you know, some truth to that. Um, so you're a lot of it in this is – breadcrumbs i mean stuff that's documented like whether i've had guys for visits or you know do private workouts which i don't think have really started yet uh, and then it's kind of talking to other people in the league so they might have heard something or it might just be an informed take but they don't know no so um i was actually talking to our viking driver from the athletic and we're just even we're just batting it around obviously he's not a source but he's more informed of what the vikings are going to do and yeah we don't know i mean it just it feels like the vikings when they make that move 
it ha- with the trade they got for the second first round pick. It has to be with the idea that this is going to be part of our package to move up to the top, let's say top five, whether it's four, five, three. Um, but the GM there, Questy, has been like super, you know, money ball and analytics. Like he might not even be, I mean, I'm sure it's part of the plan, but he might say, okay, worst case, we can't do that. We can trade back from 11 and get more. Like he's been very trade happy in the draft. So he might not be like all, it's all or nothing. We have to move up for quarterback. I think that's the plan. And as far as you're worried about outbidding, like there's no there's no package unless they just throw something ridiculous that I would think Minnesota's would be more attractive because if you're trading with the Giants, let's say you're the fourth pick at Arizona or fifth pick at the Chargers, you would make one or two spots. So yes, two middle of the first round picks this year, whatever the trade chart says. But if I know I can still get like Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors if I'm not in the market for a quarterback, like that to me outweighs that other second, you know, that other first round pick because. You know, both teams are going to have to put in a, you know, a first round pick from next year, you presume, and whatever middle, you know, middle round package. If the Giants really want them, that wouldn't be the tiebreaker. So it feels like if they want to beat out Minnesota, they can and they will. I just don't know if they're going to. So that was a very long non answer to that question because I don't know. Do you think they should? Oof. Again, it's like. I- I don't – the one thing I, I've given up is, like, pretending I'm a scout. You know what I mean? Like, I love Josh Rosen. I thought Patrick Mahomes, like, wasn't going to be good. Like, you just realize, like, you, you don't know. I, and I, But I don't even put the time in to pretend like I know. So, it's like you're just going off narrative. So NFL people JJ. don't even know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, too. That, that gave me some solace when, like, oh, like how, how could you like Josh Rosen? It's like, well, I don't know, a GM picked him 10th. And, you know, so a lot of people get these things wrong. But, yeah, so with McCarthy, it's like – I go to like more of like the experts and like, it just, it didn't feel like he was, anyone was talking about him as being like the fourth pick until all of a sudden the last month. So I know it's been this whole discussion of like, Oh, once you start watching his tape, I think you you or uh, you, Bobby or Ethan, or one of you guys made the joke about how like the people process watching his film. It's like, Oh, this kid's terrible. It's like, but the more you watch him, he's the greatest thing I've ever seen. It's it's a weird dynamic there. (laughs) Everybody has that take. I, 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 uh, I, I will pretend really to be watch. a scout. I, I'm, I am against it. I am, I am full on against it. Okay. And I'm, and I'm dreading that. Even though you're plugged into New England a little bit, can we? Ha- is there any delusion we can hold on to that they might trade out of pick three? Because that is what I would be excited for. I don't think so. Like, I mean, Mayo's, <laughs> Mayo's kind of been all over the place in some of his public comments. But I think at the end of the day, from what I, from what I gather, again, I'm not sitting like source says but like i just can't see them trading out of that spot because if, if they're going to get may or daniels there like they just desperately need a quarterback like i know that has been sort of the wild card team there of the top three because everyone knows one and two are going quarterback but there's just been really nothing concrete to make me believe they're not going to go with the quarterback when they're in that position yeah i i just want some delusion to hold on to <laughs> um so we talked about Dable calling plays. Oh, here's one. You you talk with them. Is Waller going to be back or not? Because the longer it goes, the more it makes you think he will be, but or maybe not. I, like, is is he coming back? Is he really going to turn down that money? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Because when I got off the phone with him, well, it was like March six, so it was a couple of weeks ago. Now I was like, he's not he's not coming back. And it wasn't because anything he he didn't like say anything off the record in that conversation. Like pretty much what we spoke about, I just like transcribed and wrote it up and just kind of let him speak for himself. So it wasn't like after it's like, Hey, off the record, what's the real deal? Like there's none of that, but I just kind of felt like when the guy was so openly like contemplating his future and like weighing the pros and cons, like how are you going to go from that to being like, you know what? I'm all in. I'm going to train eight hours a day. Cause especially with him with his injuries, like it's, it's probably a more extensive process to, prehab and do everything you have to do to make sure you can you know perform at a high level but you know i do agree with your point the longer this drags out because i mean it was funny i talked to him it was like the week four free agency and he said like you know i know the draft's coming up i gotta make a decision pretty soon and so i was like well like yeah the draft's coming up like free agency in like a week (laughs) like that might matter too and he's like oh no i like he basically said like i i'm not gonna know in a week that's not enough time so he's been contemplating this since the season ended right like we've had someone tell us like a month before that stuff came out like don't be so sure waller's back and then yeah and so (laughs) yeah i I mean he's a deep thinker so i don't don't know how much contemplation is required but like he threw out the draft i mean they report for the offseason program uh, April 15th, and I believe he has a, a hefty workout bonus. I mean, listen, if he walks away, he's leaving millions of, on the table. But if you're going to play, you'd think you'd probably show up for that and collect your 500 grand, 300 grand, whatever it is. So it feels like there's like a soft deadline coming up, whether it's April 15th or the draft, I think it's April 25th. Like at some point, you kind of have to make a decision. 
I don't think you can drag it out to August, but I do think the Giants from the from their perspective, like at this point, you're not going to get a receiving tight end with his ability. So it's either he's back and it's like a bonus, or you're, you're going to have this different type of offense where Bellinger's back to being tight end one. You've draft, you've uh, signed these these blocking tight ends. Going to change your offense, but there's no real reason for them to be like we need to know. I mean, at some point it might get to that, but again, I think they probably look at it like if he comes back, it's a bonus at this point, and if he doesn't. All right. Like, you know, it sucks. Life goes on. They get some cap space out of it. But yeah, so my impression three weeks ago was like, he's, he's not coming back. I still lean that way, but I mean, I, I guess we'll probably find out soon. It's just, it just feels like when you start talking the way he was talking, it's hard for me to believe that you're going to be all in and do everything you need. Um, but it is a lot of money. You can't believe it on the tail. If he doesn't play. I have so a you conspiracy don't get, theory. You, I just, I'm tweeting it out right now that he's going to uh, retire and then drop his album at the exact same time to get more plays uh-huh. on his album. Which the more I think about it makes I, I was literally thinking of that as as I asked the question. I thought he just so. dropped a new album. Then he would have to write a whole new album. Um, no, he's working on the album. Oh, he's working on the. Oh, he's dropping singles. Uh, I guess that's how that works. You don't get the impression that the Giants have a have a deadline because basically they they could choose to cut him or he could retire, and it's the same it's the same thing that's, financially for the Giants. So I mean, like I I'm I mean, as a fan, I'm getting a little impatient, and if I'm the Giants, I would be getting a little in, impatient too. I Dable does value the tight end position a little bit more than than I think some fans le- like to think. He even saw he he threw like a temper tantrum when Payne Durham when the Bucks traded up one spot <laughs> to get Payne Durham last year, and that was with Waller and Bellinger on the roster. Uh, yeah, but to that financial point is why I don't think there is like this angst within the team because it's like if he retires or if you have to just cut him because you're like tired of waiting like that one will come to that point like it's not like oh man if he doesn't make a decision by x like it's gonna cost us on the cap it's the same exact if whether he walks away tomorrow or you know sometime in may or whatever it's like so there's no real reason to rush it and honestly like this tight end class um again from the people who know so it's not very strong so i don't think they're like gonna take a tight end earlier just because of what, like it isn't a great tight end class so they're not gonna use like that second round pick on a tight end probably so again it, it's not the greatest situation i'm sure they're not thrilled by it um but again it's like what they can't what are they gonna force his hand because then you might say okay screw it then i'm retiring i'm gonna be like jerks about it or whatever so like they kind of have to have this kid gloves approach because again i, I mean I think they realize he adds value to the team. Whatever last year didn't go great with the injuries, you know, wasn't super productive, but he's still better than whatever, you know, getting more snaps for Jack Stoll isn't going to like improve the tight end room. So having Darren Waller there is still benefits. I think that's why they have to kind of have this like, Hey, we're going to let you take your time. But yeah, I mean, I think at some point, I mean, again, he said three weeks ago, I'm going to make a decision pretty soon. So if we go through the draft and there's still no decision, it, it would be a little bit, a little drawn out at that point, I think it's fair to say. I love relative terms. Pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon. All right, Dan Duggan, I got a question for you. Whether you're happy or unhappy with your performance in the bedroom, you don't have to say anything, Dan. Why not perform even better? The issue is that the over-the-counter erection pills, not election, erection pills, contain unregulated chemicals, suggest unsafe doses, and include the risk of several other health problems. You can't do that, guys can't get that stuff at the gas station that's why we partnered with our friends over at joy mode whether you're looking to spice up your intimate moments or increase your confidence in the bedroom joy mode makes all natural and science-backed supplements dedicated to help men perform better their trademark product the sexual performance booster is every man's solution to increase blood flow firmness if you know what i mean stamina if you know what i mean and performance if you know what i mean if you don't know what i mean ask danny king he uses this stuff Mm. it's like a pre-workout but for sex it comes with a palm sized packet like your favorite electrolyte powder simply mix with six to eight ounces of water 45 minutes before sexual activity and watch the magic unfold watch the sorcery unfold Redefine your intimacy like Danny King and go to usejoymode.com slash giants and get 20% off with code giants at checkout. That's 20% off and free shipping with code giants at usejoymode.com slash giants. Great sex. Solved naturally. You'll be glad you did. You will be glad you did, Dan Duggan. Now let's ask you another question. What do you think of the Brian Burns trade? Like, worth it? Like, like just kind of overall thoughts on that. Because yeah, that's one of those ones where it's like you always want to read into a big move. Like, what does this say about 
the direction, what they think. Because, again, they can sit at the podium or they can talk to us and just completely lie or misdirect you. But, like, what you do with your resources, there's no hiding that. There's no misdirecting that. So, like, for instance, last year when they make the trade for Waller, that was when to use um, – I think the the word Shane used after the season was like expedited the process. It's like you're you're giving up a day two draft pick for a thirty plus tight end with injury history. Like you're kind of going for it. So when you make a move like Burns, it certainly has that feeling on the surface level. But the fact that he was he 25, 26, 25. super yeah, super durable, plays a premium position, like that guy fits on any timeline. Like if you're trying to win the Super Bowl yeah. this year, Brian Burns helps you do that. But the five year contract, you're trying to think, hey, we're gonna draft the quarterback this year. In two or three years, we're going to have the benefits of that rookie deal, and we're going to have an elite edge rusher in his prime making, you know, whatever it's going to be, his cap at like $30 million. Then that still fits that timeline too. So I don't think it like says anything super revealing about their process. It's it's a lot to give up though, I think. I think sometimes people kind of just sneeze at that. Oh, he's a great player. It's like he is, but he hasn't been like Miles Garrett and TJ Watt great. Like he's been really good, productive, but he's – He's getting paid as the second highest edge rusher in the league. He has not been the second best edge rusher in the league during his career. Now you can point to circumstances, and maybe it'll be different here with with Dex and and Kayvon, maybe. But like he needs to be like that level of player, and we haven't seen it yet. And the second round pick, that's a cost controlled asset for four years. It's a, you know it's an early second round pick. Like that should be a starter core player. So when you're in a rebuild, it is a little tough. To just kind of like, hey, whatever. We got Brian Burns with us. Like, well, yeah, but you could have spent all that money on a free agent and still had the second round pick. So uh, I can see it both ways, but I think the fact that he is so young, it's those guys are very hard to come by and it's just for their sake. He better still be, you know, the arrows still better be pointing up like this better not be the most we've seen him. And they must believe he can still reach another level. Cause again, he's getting paid. Like they're expecting that. Dan, you've mentioned some buzzwords like rebuild and, you know, kind of timeline of, of rookie contract. And I'm going to ask you a question. I, I don't have, I don't have an answer too, because it's the question that I've, I'm jostling with myself as a fan of this team. Shane says compete for today and build for tomorrow. And we're in year three. Um, and, you, and you just talked to John Mary. You kind of talked about timeline and expectations and for Shane and, and, and Dable heading into, heading into year three. You said the team's rebuilding, but are they? Like, where, where do you think this, this team is at in, in terms of embracing a rebuild, but you got a quarterback with the $47 million cap hit. You did just trade away a second round pick for, yeah, you know, a, you know, a blue chip player who's young and could help any team at any stage. You're right. But they did just trade away a second round player. They, they did spend the most money in the NFL in free agency. That's not typically what rebuilding teams do. So tell me kind of like your thoughts, opinions, or whatever on compete for today, build for tomorrow and where the giants are on this interesting timeline that they're on. Yeah, and it totally is. I that's, I actually asked Shane that question because a lot of times a regime comes in and it's like, you know, year one, you kind of take your lumps, you clean up the cap, you're not expecting to go, you know, win nine games, win a playoff game. So, like, that obviously changed things. And then, obviously, year two, they took the step back. You want it to be building, you know, each year, getting better and better and better. So, it's like they, they spiked high the first year and then dropped down the second year. So, it's like, yeah, where are you now? Because you've made investments that a rebuilding team typically wouldn't have made, like, you know, you know, going for the Darren Wall trade, I know the huge investment Daniel Jones. You'd rather, you know, obviously feel a little better about your quarterback future if, after doing that. Um, but so yeah, he kind of gave a, a meandering answer of like, well, yeah, we're still building, we're we're making progress, but it's like it's it's just hard to buy the progress line when we saw the product on the field last year. So it's like, well, like what was what was the progress we're seeing here? You know, so that's why this is a thing that's probably been said a lot in, in the Giants world in the last however many months. It's like, if you just flipped the two years, you'd have a totally different view of yes. this regime. Like if they bottomed out in year one, you know, Saquon would have been gone, Daniel Jones would have been gone. And then if year two, you have success. It's like, oh, wow, now they're really building towards something. But the way they did it, it's like the, the plan has taken some detours and I think they're trying to get back on the track. And that's why, yeah, I don't know if I said they're rebuilding. I don't know what they are yet. And I don't think we'll really have a definitive answer on that until the draft. Like, what they do, if they trade up for a quarterback, to me, that's them saying, okay, like, we're kind of starting over here. Like, yeah, we have some pieces, but this is a longer-term process. If somehow they don't come out of this, you know, first round, because I'm not even buying, like, a day-two quarterback or anything like that, but if they don't come out of with that sixth pick or moving up a quarterback, then it feels like they're just kind of continuing on the same path. Like, you're going to have Daniel Jones and, and Tommy DeVito and Drew Locke as your quarterback room, and, you you know, obviously you've – you're hoping you got some wide receiver one, but then what's the plan? You, 
for next year. Like, it, so it's, I think the quarterback, where they end up after the draft, a quarterback is going to be the ultimate tell of where they really think this thing is headed and, and how they're planning to take that next step. Because right now it feels like they're, they're, they're kind of, they kind of spun their wheels this past year. Like they didn't make any progress. And obviously they more, more likely went backwards. So with that, because obviously, I think we all know they would love to draft a quarterback. The issue is one, one may not be there, and two, the one that is there isn't worth taking, you know. And I know the I haven't watched any of next year's draft, but people say, oh, next year's class isn't good. But I also don't think, you know, drafting Mac Jones is, you know, I don't think Kenny Pickett and Malik Willis being the best two QBs in the class is a reason to draft Mac Jones. Do you think there would be patience from Mara if they're like, hey, we understand that there needs to be upgraded quarterback, but there's just there's that guy's not there, and there's a good chance he may not be there next year. Like, is is there a way they get like a year? I know this is so far advanced, but is there like yeah. a vision of like, hey, this could take some time. Like, have some patience with us. And that's where it gets tough because it, that goes back to the point I said with Mara. It's like he's like, yeah, I support them, but I haven't given them any guarantees. Where if he said like Joe, no matter what happens, you know, you sign a five year contract, let's say you're going to get to see that through, and no, no one is really going to do that. And again, he confirmed he hasn't done that, but it is tough because it's like that position obviously dictates everything. So if you say, hey, we just can't do it this year, or we're not, it's not worth trading up to four for JJ McCarthy. We don't believe in him. Whatever it may be. So we're kind of just going to stuck. We're going to run it back with DJ and hopefully he's healthy. And I'm sure they probably would draft somebody on day two and be like, hey, like hey, this could be the next Jalen Hurts, like developmental guy, whatever it may be. But yeah, you don't have like, all right, this is the plan. I do kind of hate the next year's quarterback class stuff because that happens every year. And like, what was Joe Burrow ranked at this time before his draft? What was Jaden Daniels ranked at this time a year ago? Like guys always rise up. So like, I mean, maybe sometimes for better or worse, like maybe they don't always deserve to. I mean, obviously Burrow, Burrow did, but I, I just think it's hard to. We can't forecast the guys after we've seen their entire college career. They've gone through the pre-draft scouting process. We still don't know who's going to be good. So you're going to tell me a guy who's played like one or two years in college without having that extra year of, of maturation? You can tell me how he's going to be in a year. I don't buy that. But no, I do think to to your more more to your point, it gets sticky there. And it, but that's where there are also other options like then you could maybe do one of these trades for a veteran you know, like the Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, like these guys end up being available. It's not ideal. Um, even like the Justin Fields types guys, like everyone's giving up on these quarterbacks early. Like there, there would be other avenues, but it's just so much cleaner. If let's just say they trade up and get Drake May, who I think that's who you kind of your eye on, or if they just love JJ McCarthy and they get him at six, they move up to get him. Like it would just be much cleaner. It might not work out, but you'd be able to sit back on April 30th and say, all right, we have our quarterback plan for the future. If you come out of this draft without a quarterback, it's you. It's kind of a leap of faith how you're going to figure it out next year. And, I mean, I guess obviously the other thing we haven't even touched on is like maybe Daniel Jones bounces back. Because one thing John Mayer did say, he's like, I still believe that that 2022 version of Daniel Jones is the real version of Daniel Jones, the guy who in the playoffs, like they've obviously you know clung to that. Um, so you can't rule out that as a possibility as, as much as you know you might think it's remote. Well, the past was a long time ago, and the future is a long way away. There's pre- pressure is <laughs> that's why it's like oh well, you know teams like these quarterbacks. Like yeah, there's a fuck ton of pressure to get a quarterback because then they'll end up losing their job. You know, you have the Brandon Bean line about Josh Allen, but you know there was reports they had Baker Mayfield as their number one and Sam Darnold's their number two. If they do that for Baker, they're you know they're not looked at as the you know the the geniuses that they 100%. are that they're looked at now. So. Um, you got anything coming down the pipe, Justin? You have anything left? Uh, do, no. Do you have anything? Any any pieces you you're working on coming down? It's it's going to be all draft now. You know, it's like you kind of it's weird because you go to the combine, there's a lot of draft stuff, but then you shift right into free agency, and that's just such a busy week or two. But yeah, now it's like catch the breath. I probably have to come up with something good and compelling. Some somehow in the next four weeks, you got to come up with something good to to advance the draft. But yeah, I mean, it's going to be. Probably kind of easy this year. I'm sure there'll be a lot of quarterback coverage and a lot of quarterback interest. But yeah, it's going to just be all draft stuff and, uh, you know, trying. I obviously didn't have a lot of answers for you right now. I, I might not in four weeks' time, anyways, but hopefully, you know, gain some more intel over that time and be able to um, provide some insights as we get close to the draft. But yeah, it's just that's going to be the obviously the dominant storyline. People eat it up and you kind of can't feed that beast enough in the weeks leading up. Can we get a follow up uh, text to Darren Waller being like, could 
Could I just get a clarification on the soon definition here? <laughs> I know. I've thought about that because you don't want to like bother a guy who's good enough to give me that first interview. But yeah, it's, it is kind of like that's, that might be the way to say it. Like, so is it soon yet? Because what's your, uh, no, just, ask, just ask him, you know, so what's your definition of soon? Because <laughs> yeah. I think we're, we're at the outer reaches of my definition of soon. But yeah, yeah, no. yeah. yeah I'd say like, yeah, maybe April, like I said, April 15th is the date that when they report. So maybe, maybe that's a good time to fall up if we haven't heard anything. But I, I kind of feel like we'll hear something to, to use the term soon. Okay. Yeah. Are, is, are the Giants the only team that the Athletic has two beat reporters on? No, there's a handful. Do you guys have like turf wars for stories? Like, no, that's I, I'm I'm hitting that story. No, actually, that was like my concern though. When they like we're bringing a second person, I was like, oh, I have my own thing here. I have to ever worry about uh, kind of sharing the ball. But no. Obviously, Charlotte Carroll, for those who aren't aware of my B partner, we've just finished our second season. So that feels crazy. Uh, but no, she's great, like awesome to work with. And it's just like at first I was like, oh, I don't need a second person. But then when there is a second person, you realize like how much more you can cover. And even yeah. even a day like today, it's like, OK, or yesterday, it's like I'll take Mara, you take Shane. It's just easier, you know, the the work balance there. But, yeah, no, it's uh, it's we had the great. same. I, you know, we had the same structure at practices. Oh yeah, we don't. Yeah. you know, John Boy Media and the Athletic dominated Detroit Lions uh, joint practices. Cause, were like, you? I, you yeah, two were watching the offense. You two yeah. were watching the offense, and Charlotte and I was wa- we were watching the defense. And then, and then also, Charlotte and I we were talking to each other, and we were both sharing our own observations with each other. It was just, it was, it was, um, it was unbelievable teamwork. But no, it is, it's yeah. a great asset stuff like that. But no, it's, there's a lot of times where it comes up because I mean, on like game days, like the New York Post will send like six people. So just even having two people kind of balances the playing field, but having two people that are like dedicated to the beat, yeah, it's, it's been a great resource, and hopefully the readers uh, feel that way as well. I have one more question. Um, has the word expect? Anytime you hear the word expect, has that is that now a a, a buzzword to either really pay attention or I, I for me I guess it is pay attention because anytime they say anytime they've said they expect something to happen the exact opposite has happened the, the, this offseason so ex- yeah. the word expect what does that mean no for it's def- it's become a loaded word for sure I just wrote about that the other day where it's like uh, I don't know, the latest expect was I think with the Daniel Jones expected to be the star that's what maybe it was after the the Drew Locke stuff and uh-huh. that's the word they kept using is like we expect him to be the star, expect him to be the star. Like, you can just say, like, he's the starter. You don't have to use that expect word. So it does raise your antenna because – They expected yeah, uh, Wink and Kafka to be back too, so. And we, and we expected Darren Waller to be back, and that was right after <laughs> the season before it was publicly known that he was constantly in retirement. I assume they did have an idea. So, like, yeah, I think um, I think Joe Shane chooses his words carefully, and so you can never really call him a liar. Um, so by saying you expect something to happen, well, I expected it, but something changed. Uh, I, I will say, I think they've doubled down hard enough this week with uh, with the Daniel Jones stuff that if he's not the week one starter and it's not for health reasons, then they would look like they were lying. Because, I mean, they really, I mean, Mara said, like, he said he expected it. Like, enough people have kind of gone in on that. But it's definitely a word that I, I don't just take, oh, okay, they expect that. That's going to happen. It's like, nah, let's, let's still check in on that because it has not uh, come to fruition on a few of these uh, expectations they've had this offseason. Did Dable say anything now that we're talking about expect and all? This will be the last question. Did he say anything directly about Wink Martindale? No, it was funny. Like, so, like, yeah, the first question of these is always awkward. We haven't talked to the guy in so long. And I was just kind of like, you know, since we last spoke, a lot happened that day, that week. Um, like, what do you have to say about how everything went down with Wink and the rest of the staff? And he just gave this, like, this was, he got it right started on the whole note of like, oh, that's in the past. Like, I'm excited to work, go forward with Shane. But he like literally never said Wink's name or referenced anything with Wink. Any question, like he got asked a direct question, like how much um, will you miss having Wink on your staff or something like that? And he answered like, well, you know, I've been in the league a long time, this turnover after every year. So like he wasn't even like acknowledging that. And I think that was very deliberate. Like, again, they ended on you know quite bad terms. But yeah, no, so he didn't, he didn't even, not only did he not touch on the topic, he didn't even mention like his name or even just refer to his existence. Like Wink was very much out of sight, out of mind for Dable today. It's all about, again, moving forward. Yeah, it's like, I, and hey, from my point of view, I was like, I've moved on totally too, but I'm like, I would like, I would like to hear something about it. Um, Cause you know, those tabloid why... wars were nuts. Like, like, oh my God, it was amazing. Um, but that's why it's smart for them to just play stall ball like this. It's annoying. I think it's kind of like weak. 
but uh, you don't have to talk to us. You just don't. And then it's like, oh, guys, that was two months ago. It's like, well, yeah, you could have held a press conference at, you know, four o'clock that Monday, called us all back. We would have gladly shown up. So to, to use that as the excuse, like, oh, that's old news. It's like, well, once upon a time, it wouldn't have been. It would have been really interesting to hear your take on it. And so now by, by doing it this way, they kind of just avoid ever having to really address it. Yeah, you guys haven't even talked to Bowen or Gobrio uh, yet either. No. All right, that's uh, Dan Duggan of The Athletic. Make sure to go and subscribe. Uh, always always great reads on there, at dduggan21 on Twitter. Uh, appreciate you as always, man. Dan, we yeah, expect to talk guys. to you soon. <laughs> well played. All right, thank you to Dan Duggan for coming on as always. Always appreciate Dan's time. And I want to tell you about a new podcast in a video series. Yeah, we've talked about it, and you're not going to want to miss it. It's called The Deal, and it's co-hosted by Yankees legend Alex Rodriguez. And he is joined by reporter Jason Kelly. They're going to speak with big-time athletes, entertainers, entertainers, and executives like Maria Sharapova, Pova, Michael Strahan, Derek Jeter, and more. The Deal. It's going to take you behind the scenes into the world of sports, media, and entertainment. Dives into the wins, the losses, and all those wonderful lessons learned, learned along the way. From Bloomberg Podcasts and Bloomberg Originals, you can listen to The Deal on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll be glad you did. Bloomberg's The Deal. You'll be glad you did. Thanks uh, thanks again, Dan Duggan, for coming on the show. Thank you, Bloomberg, Joy Mode, and DraftKings. We appreciate you guys, as always. Justin, any, any parting thoughts before we go? No, this is... Uh... My last episode that I'll be on until draft month. Um, you know, here's here's my here's my plea. If you want to learn about some draft prospects, if if you want to continue to be entertained while you're at work, while you're on your way to school, while you're doing whatever, stick with us through draft month because we uh we we structure the episodes in a way to tell you that hey, we we do our homework, we try and get to know these players so then by the time that the Giants draft want one of these guys or even if they don't draft any of them, uh, you know that we do our homework. You know that we work hard. We know that you know we're the we're the spot that you want to go to to find out what these cats are all about. So draft month and the draft month episodes are all part of it. How about that? I found a tight end I like. Don't know if I'm gonna be able to take him though. Uh, all right, we appreciate you guys. We will see you on Friday with Nick Filato. Until then, let's go big blue. <laughs>